Merry Christmas. Just in case you didn't know, Christmas came a little early last evening when the Buffalo Bills won the division. And <laughs> Even people who don't like the Bills have felt so bad for us for so long that they're cheering. Hey, uh, could I take a minute just to pray for you before we get into our talk today? Uh, let's just bow our heads. Uh, Father, um, honestly, we're tired. We're, we're tired of the things we have to do. And we're tired from things we're not getting to do. And so I ask that you would provide us strength. Uh, the truth is we need, we need your strength more than we need our way. We need more grace because there seems to be less of it going around. And I ask that you would help us take a lesson from the season that we're celebrating. There was a couple who was separated from their family because of a government requirement. They found themselves in an animal shelter. And yet in the midst of their isolation, their separation and their lack of resources, you found a way to bring light into that darkness and you found a way to release life into their lives and you found a way to bring gifts from afar and you found a way to have their time invaded with joy. And so we ask you to do that all over again this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, welcome to everyone who's here uh, uh, live and in person and everyone who's online. We're so thrilled that you're joining us. We're in a series called The Christmas We Need. And last week we talked about needing a Christmas with a promise. Today we are going to talk about needing Christmas with proof. We need proof that God is for us. And so we're also using some less traditional scriptures to address the Christmas theme, not because we're tired of the traditional Christmas scriptures, but because I want to reinforce the fact that really all of scripture tells the story of Jesus. And so we're in Galatians chapter 4, and it said, but when the set time had fully come, it's an important phrase, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And in Romans chapter five, it says, you see then it just the right time. When you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In life, timing matters. I've heard the phrase, timing is everything. I don't know if it's everything, but I do know it's important. You can be in the right place, but if you are there at the wrong time, opportunity evaporates. We tend to be a time conscious culture, but we tend to also be a little undiscerning about timing. And it's easy to mess up timing. Things that tend to kind of wreck our capacity to get timing right are things like impatience. We can get tired of waiting for something. We, we can become afraid that something's not going to come our way. We can be greedy, want something that maybe we haven't earned or don't deserve yet. Pride often wars against our timing and, and we can want good things, but not always for the best reasons. Uh, for example, someone might want a really good friend or a life partner. And when you ask them why, and, and their answer is, because I don't want to be alone anymore. 
Is that the best reason to tie someone to you for the rest of your life? Maybe not. What's interesting is that God is not driven by impatience or fear or greed or pride. God is the most patient, he's the bravest, he's the most generous and the most humble being in the universe. And it's the reason why his timing is always exactly right. So these passages of scripture are driving home some important information related to the timing of God. God does what is right at the right time. The passage in Galatians says, the time had fully come, and in Romans, at just the right time. Timing recognizes when opportunity is about to open. If you're, if you're into the stock market, there are times when there's a company that no one is paying attention to, and people will buy the stock, and then it just skyrockets up, and, uh, and then everybody else wants to buy it when it's high. And then sometimes people will sell their stock just before everything goes down, and lots of other people will sell that stock when it is low. The, the truth is, there are times when something is about to open up, and, and sometimes when that happens, we're not sure if there's going to be another opportunity like that. So many people actually don't look for open doors. They look for excuses not to go through the ones they see. Timing can also kind of indicate when something is about to close, because time can run out. We can be out of time. And this is what I've discovered. The more fed up people are, the faster time runs out. We become very intolerant when we've had enough. And so some people will consider different options, and they'll look to get out of something. Very powerful thing. So there are a couple of important factors that influence the timing of God. What made it just the right time and the fullness of time for his son to come? And the first is that religion had actually become intolerable. Religion had become intolerable. It had deteriorated from lifting people up to pushing people down. That what God intended to actually help people move towards him became something that caused people to keep their distance from him. And instead of explaining God's word, people were told, you're just not smart enough in order to understand it. This is only for special people. Instead of helping people find their way to God, there wound up being a lot of hurdles and, and barriers put in between them and God. And instead of empowering people to live in the freedom that God intended, religion found ways to manipulate people and enslave them. Um, for example, the, the issue of shame. God actually intended religion to deal with the shame issue, and instead religion found a way to use shame to get even more from people. And here's the horrible thing about religion. Religion can feel right when you're doing wrong. Religion will feel right when you're doing wrong. I'm sure you may have heard the quote from St. John Mayer, where he said, did you know that you could be wrong and swear you're right? Some people have been known to do it all their lives. Self-righteousness makes you feel right and keeps you from helping anyone else. Because if they were as right as you, they would be able to do it themselves. It's just a horrible thing. So religion had really deteriorated, and politics had become unbearable. I know you probably think we're back in that situation again. Maybe we are. But people were taxed beyond any reasonable measure. Uh, it didn't just take away some of their access or their abundance. It cut into where they could do a lot less. In fact, survivability for many people was uncertain. And the conquest of other nations and other peoples became more important than taking care of the people that were already part of an empire. And people uh, were manipulated so that others, the few and the powerful, could gain even more of what they already had a lot of. The systems didn't address injustice. The systems were actually used to impose injustice. So you see, life was already hard. Religion and politics made it even harder. 
And that was just the right time for God to do something. People were disillusioned. They were disheartened. They were discouraged. The religious system and the political system seemed to be stacked against them. And so at the time when most people didn't even want to be here, God came here. Religion didn't keep God from coming to us, and politics didn't keep God from coming to us. Even though they did not reflect and they did not represent God, it didn't keep God from showing up. So God moved, interestingly enough, from declaration to demonstration. All through the Old Testament, he kept sending messages to his people. This is what I want to do in your lives. This is how I'd like your life to be. This is what's possible if you'll humble yourself and walk with me. And he kept sending messages. He kept declaring truth to them, but they weren't hearing it. And so the passage in Romans says he demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his love. He didn't just send another message. He sent his son. And there's a message in how his son came to us. If I were God and I were sending my son, I wouldn't have done it the way that he did it. I would have had a throne that descended from heaven that when it landed on earth, it shook the entire planet. And I would have made sure everybody knew that's not how he comes into our world. He didn't come as a privileged person, and he didn't come as an exempt person who's not under all the same challenges everyone else is. He was born of a woman. He came into our world the same way you did. Think about that. And he was under the law. Paul makes that point. He was under the law. Jesus didn't consider himself above the law. He came to fulfill the law. And who did God come for? He came for people who were powerless. You know, sometimes people just want a powerful person to take care of everything for them. And sometimes people actually don't want... Um, well, let's put it this way. Sometimes what people want is a dictator that agrees with them. That's why there's so many dictators in our world. Dictators do not control any, anyone's heart. Dictators reveal what's in people's hearts. That's how they get their power. Someone with power will do what we want, and we'll support that. So God decided that this was personal. And that's why he shows up personally. He didn't come just to do something for us. He came to be with us as one of us. He entered our world cold and hungry and, is, and impoverished, and his vocabulary was reduced to the quivering cry of an infant who needed milk. The God who'd never known any lack any discomfort, any inequity entered our world through our womb, wrapped in claws, and laid in a feeding trough because there was no place else for him. Our world makes lots of room for false gods and pretend gods and idols. There's never a shortage of space for them, but our world doesn't know what to do with the true and the living God. So Jesus came as one who is not exempt from the law, because we are not exempt from the law. I know we work really hard to avoid a lot of things, right? And we can for a while, but eventually we're all held accountable for the things we say and the things we do. Eventually, we will lose our grip on the things we trusted in. The good news is, is that God never loses his grip on those who trusted him. So a price had to be paid for the sins of the world. That's what the word means, redeem. To redeem means that you, you pay the price, which frustrates a lot of people. Why couldn't God just say, I forgive you? Why couldn't he just say that? And this is what I want you to hear, because this is one of the most common arguments 
against what people consider to be the bloody gospel of Christianity where someone's life had to be forfeit and blood had to be shed and, and they're offended by that reality. Anyone who says, anyone who says, why couldn't God just forgive? One of two things or maybe both are true of them. And the first is no one has seriously sinned against them. No one has betrayed them or taken something very precious from them because when someone has seriously sinned against them, they don't just think that words fix this. And they don't believe they've ever seriously sinned. They've put their sins in a category as a mild inconvenience at best for a few people. It's not a big deal. Or the favorite trope that gets trotted out when someone is trying to be uh, hold someone else accountable for their actions or their words. They'll say, I didn't hurt anyone but myself. It's never true. Never true. You can't commit a sin and not hurt someone but yourself. And so when people say, why couldn't God just forgive? They don't believe they've ever sinned seriously and they've never had someone sin very seriously against them because sin is not just an act to be forgotten. It is also a debt to be paid. And here's the challenge. We don't have the resources for that debt. Here's the good news. That debt has been paid for us. <laughs> Is that not good news? I think that's a good place for an amen. What do you think? Yeah, I do. The good news is that the debt has been paid. Jesus came in person because his mission was personal. He loves us too much to destroy us. He loves us too much to leave us as he were. So he came to be with us. He came to be one of us, God with us. Jesus leaves his world to enter our world and he gives his life to give us life. And this is the language of sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed everything for a reason. If you want to know what drives the motives, what's the motive behind what Jesus' actions are? And the answer is love. It's the only reason that explains why he did what he did. How do we know it was love? Please hear this. This is an important lesson for all of us to remember. Sacrifice is the language of love. Sacrifice is the language of love. Oh, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we enjoy being around people. There's lots of people I like being around. They're funny, they're witty, they're clever. They agree with me. This is wonderful. Who doesn't want to be around people like that? And so I can think, I just, I love being around them. What am I really loving? I'm loving that I feel accepted. I'm loving that I feel... Um, like I'm valued, I'm, I'm loving that that environment is easy for me. Now, you can love someone that you feel comfortable with and enjoy being around, but it's also possible that you can just enjoy being around someone. How can you tell the difference? And the answer is because love always sacrifices. And if you're unwilling to sacrifice anything for those individuals, you just enjoy them. You'll use them. They serve a purpose for you, not the same thing. So, uh, how can you tell the difference? One sacrifices, one does. So who does Jesus sacrifice for? He sacrifices for the powerless. He sacrifices for people who don't deserve it. While we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. He sacrifices. What drives that? His love. Now, there are lots of people who are uncomfortable with making sacrifices. They feel like they're being taken advantage of. Our culture kind of reinforces that value. But here's what you need to know, is people who will not sacrifice for others will often make a sacrifice of others. That's what happens. When you think about the sacrifices you have made in your life, what motivated it? What drove it? Why did you do it? Why do parents sacrifice for their children? Why do spouses sacrifice for their partner? Why do we make sacrifices for our parents? Sacrifice is the language of love. We can sacrifice in the hope that something good will come. 
We can sacrifice in the faith that things will get better. We can sacrifice because we want what's best for another person. That's what love is. Love is not just an emotion. Emotions kind of ebb and flow and come and go. They go up and down. But love is a commitment to want the best for the other person, and you will help that happen even if it costs you something. That's what love is. Yeah. Many years ago, uh, when I was growing up in, in our family, our, uh, our, we were economically challenged, let's put it that way. There were a number of things that had happened, and, and uh, uh, no one's fault. It was just what was true. And there was uh, a little lady in our church, and she really was a sweetheart. And if you ever went to her house, you always got candy. And so anytime my dad said he was going to visit her house, I would, I would go, because I knew what was coming and you would get some candy. There were some other things that were true about uh, this precious little lady. Her name was Emma. And I'm using her real name because she's, she's long since gone from this world. But when Emma had food items that were spoiling, when the meat started smelling bad, she would call us and offer us a gift And so we would go over, and what are you supposed to do? Say, this smells terrible. I'm not going to take this. Uh, no, we, we would take it. And then we would have to find a way to dispose of it. So, well, didn't she ask you what happened to it, how it was? And uh, sometimes we had to run some stuff down the disposal. And if she asked us how it was, we just told her it went down easy. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's another guy in the, in the Bible, his name is David. He was king of Israel. He'd actually crossed a serious line, and God was holding him accountable for it. And, and he wants to make things right as best he can. And so he goes, he wants to make a sacrifice. Uh, 2 Samuel 24, I think, is the reference to find the story if you want to read up on it later. And so he, he goes to make the sacrifice, and he's at a place where there's another person who owns all the elements required for the sacrifice, the animals and the, and the wood and everything. And so he just comes to his king and he says, I'll give it all to you. You can use anything I have, no charge. And King David looked at him and he said, I will not offer to the Lord what costs me nothing. Why does he say that? Is he trying to buy favor? No, it's the language of love. I want to invest something into this that actually costs me because I do have love for God. I do have faith that things are going to be better than they are right now, and he's willing to make that decision. So, in a world that wants to know what it can get right, what it can get, God comes and he shares what he will give. So when the time was just right, Jesus came into our world. So I have a question for you. I'll ask the worship team to come. When the time was right, Jesus came into our world. Maybe today the time is right for you to let Jesus into your life, into your heart. You may have heard a thousand times the Christmas story. And you may have heard many times what God desires and intends for your life. But I would like you to think freshly today. Maybe the time is just right. Maybe God has come for this moment right now. So whether you're here or you're watching online, would you just bow your head right now? Heavenly Father, um, we often miss timing opportunities. And uh, there are things we get distracted by and, and things that we desire, and we don't always see what you're up to. Would you help us today to see your grace, to see your mercy, to see what you have done at just the right time, and would you give us the courage to allow you into our lives? 
We acknowledge we're not perfect. We acknowledge that the things we have said and done shouldn't just be overlooked. A price should be paid. And you have graciously, mercifully, generously paid that price for us. Today, we choose to accept that gift from you. In Jesus' name, amen.